Okay, welcome back. Let's look at the currents in a BJT. Same layout as we, we had before. We're now starting to uh, uh, use the PN junction equations that we had for the charge densities, for the minority carriers, and start deriving some current expressions for this BJT. All right, of course, we start again from the semiconductor equations. We had just used for uh, equilibrium the Poisson expression to draw a band edge diagram that we have at the bottom now. Now we're going to do this out of equilibrium and we'll use the drift and diffusion expressions uh, for the variety of currents we calculate and also in the next section when we talk about um, AC response, etc. So uh, let's uh, dive in a little bit. I had just shown in the previous section the expressions for the uh, depletion region lengths for, uh, for the respective carriers on each of the junction sides. So nothing new there. And if you remember right, uh, we're, all we're doing is when we're plugging in a, a, a bias, we just draw a, two PN junctions under bias like this. So here's our uh, PN junction like this, and this would be in forward bias, right? So electrons can easily go from here to here and be injected this way. We typically consider here in the, uh, the course um, or in the, in the introduction that this is in reverse bias, okay? So the Fermi level difference is going down like this. Here it is going up from uh, N to P and here it's going down from P to N. And all we're doing is we're putting in the respective voltages that are uh, applied to these junctions, okay? So we're saying we're applying a voltage to the, uh, between the emitter and the base where we have a contact here to the base, and we're applying a voltage here between the collector and the base. That's the voltage here. And we're shifting the quasi-Fermi levels around, just like what we had done in a PN junction. So the expressions are absolutely identical. The only thing that changed were a little bit here the indices, trying to identify more clearly about which junction we're talking about. So nothing really new here. All the knowledge you've gained, and hopefully gained, on PN junctions is being now transferred into two back-to-back -back NP junctions. All right. Now, how about that current flow? Uh, what a transistor is supposed to do is, with a small control signal, govern a much larger electron flow. It's a switch. So you want to spend little energy on... Uh, or effort on having a bigger impact, okay? So this base current here, the base, is doing the action of the switching, and it's regulating overall the flow of electrons across the device. And it's doing that by the control of holes being injected here and the electrostatics of the junctions, okay? So, Let's look at that a little bit more detail. And here see, you see sketched out sort of a under bias, um, art, art, artsy uh, representation of electron flow in the structure. And uh, what you have here is in a forward bias, PN junction, NP junction like this, electrons can more easily make it through here. And you have a reverse bias junction here, so there's very few electrons that make it up, but there's a lot of electrons that make it through the base and come over here, okay? And we'll study the ratios, the res uh, relative ratios of these current flows, and hopefully we'll be able to convince you that this is a transistor that actually enables uh, a regulation of current, okay? Now, just as a pictorial uh, description, I've shown you something that looks similar. In the very first uh, lecture of the course, a sketch on how a transistor works. So I just want to revive that animation again. So here you have an electrostatic potential. This is for an MOS device, but the, the operating or the... the, the uh, Equivalent picture is similar, especially for very small-scale transistors that we have today. 
but just take it as a guide to the operating principle. So you have a way of regulating a barrier that uh, controls the injection of uh, carriers into the channel. So even at uh, zero applied gate voltage, there's some leakage current. Some current is flowing because you have a voltage applied between the source and the drain, or in the sense that the emitter and the collector. So there's some leakage. And as you increase the gate voltage, or the uh, uh, mod modulate or change the potential on the base, you allow more carriers to flow, and the current rises. It rises at a certain uh, level, and you'll see where in a BJT, the 60 millivolt per decade come from very soon. And as you increase the voltage further, you eventually uh, provide all the current that you can provide in this device. Okay, so you basically open the channel, and as much many carriers as you can pump through, you are pumping through and you're beginning to saturate. And the saturation mechanisms might be different in a MOSFET and a BJT, they definitely are. But this is just a pictogram to give you a feeling for how uh, electron flows in this device. So with little change to an emitter or an, uh, a gate voltage, you can regulate current. You might also remember in the first lecture I had shown you the sketch on the left, where I talked about, well, you have a density of states like this, and you have a Fermi function like this, and the Fermi function cuts off with a certain tail. Now these terms should be very familiar to you now. So we've covered a lot of ground in the course so far. And now let's dive again more into the BJT example. So in the BJT, what we want to know is what's the carrier distribution in the base? Because the base um, um, uh, regulates the current flow, okay? So now we're looking at the electron density in the base. Now we have an N P N device, the minority carriers that we're controlling in the P device are the electrons, okay? And we have calculated before how a, a forward bias junction in the diffusion limit injects carriers here at the edge of the depletion region. And we've calculated how these carriers decrease linearly if you don't have recombination generation to some contact. The some contact now is what we have really on the um, on the right hand side the other junction. Okay? So let's carry this forward a little bit. Let's define here the coordinate system. Uh, we start, we define this as 0 and x and we call this the base width. And just carrying forward like what we have done before. You look up your notes, you transfer over that the, the, the excess minority carriers that are generated at this junction are proportional to the exponential of the applied voltage between the two Fermi levels. So that's VBE times a coefficient that depends on the base doping. Okay? And as you increase uh, the positive bias, this term grows exponentially. And if you uh, have this in reverse bias, you have virtually no excess carriers there that are minority carriers, because this term exponentially vanishes here. Okay? So just like what we had before, PN junction. Now on the right hand side, you can do the same thing. What's the boundary condition there? On the right hand side, at the x equal the, um, the base width, now the excess carriers of the electrons are exponentially depending on the, the base collector voltage. So on this voltage here, okay? And this is in reverse bias. So this term is negative. So this goes to nothingness, almost zero. That means this term here is very small, okay? It's just the intrinsic um, carrier concentration squared over the, over the doping. So we know that that number is very small, okay? It's smaller than um, 
n i square uh, n i b at the base. All right, so we can just, uh, for argument's sake, call this very small, and we're decaying down. And if we assume no recombination, we know it goes down linearly. We can set up an expression for the carrier distribution, just like what we had done before. We've solved this kind of differential equation before. We know the linear ansatz is that it's a linear expression, because there's no recombination generation. And if we choose our coordinate system wisely, where we identify coefficients c and d wisely, we can identify this, this must be c and this must be d. Okay? Makes, makes sense. If you plug in x equals 0, you get the c. If you plug in x equals wb, that's a 1. So this is 1 and this goes to 0. So this makes sense. Right? That's just a smart choice of your coordinate system or your ansatz. All right, if that's the case, and we have expressions for C and D, we can plug them in. So here's your expression, carrier distribution in a base under bias. All we did is we transfer the knowledge from PN junctions as we had before, and we've solved these differential expressions, equations before. So no black magic here. All we're treating is the, the inner piece of the base, okay? Okay. Now, if we have a carrier distribution in the base, and we're just wanting to calculate the current in the base, we can do that, right? We can calculate here at this point, at the uh, base junction side, we can uh, calculate the current flow in the collector. And we had, again, previously assumed that the number of carriers that make it through the junction is constant. So we calculate the current in, uh, at this point to get uh, the, the collector current. And we take the, and we assume that this is a diffusion content, right? We have neglected, just as we had done before, the um, field term. So we just take the differential of n with, uh, with x. That's just part of the drift diffusion equation, right? And we're dropping off the drift term and uh, plug this in. So if we do that, very simple, right? We've done this for individual junctions, and now we do this for uh, two junction. We have a term that stems from the right-hand side, and we have a term that stems from the left-hand side, okay? One goes with VBE, this guy, and one goes with BBC, this guy. All right? Nothing fancy, really. It's just, again, transfer from the PN junction. We can also calculate on the um, emitter base side the whole current that is being injected. And we can do that here, and these are the expressions, right? So you can, uh, again, you had an uh, expression for the current um, as a differential of P. We had written down um, the excess carriers on the uh, excess minority carries, which is holes in the emitter. So again, nothing fancy here. We have an expression also for the holes that are being injected from in, as minority carries here. Okay, so let's look at these expressions. We know that this goes, if I plot as a log the current in the collector, as a function of VBE, like this, and if I do it on a log 10 basis, I can see that at T equals 300 Kelvin, Kelvin, I get a slope of 60 millivolt per decade, which is really uh, this uh, coming from this term here. Okay? You can figure out what the slope is. What, what is the rate of increase if you do this in a, um, a plug in the log term, okay, at room temperature. So the best you can get out of this transistor is an increase of 60 millivolt per decade just from thermionic uh, thermal uh, consideration in this exponent. Okay, it's the same physics as a diode. It has the same rollover. And uh, you can now ramp up 
the base current and plot for different base currents um, the uh, current voltage characteristic. And this is called the output characteristic. And ideally, these would be flat lines. We'll talk about that. But they're not flat in reality. And we'll talk about why that is. And it's called the early effect. It's not that it's happening, happening earlier than later. There's a early um, semiconductor device physicist by the name Early who defined these expressions and, and explained them well. All right. So we have currents. Here's the current expression. And we didn't spend hours deriving things. We just transferred our knowledge from PN junctions. That's kind of the beautiful piece about these bipolar junction transistors. All right. So in the next section, we're talking about an abers mall model that completes this a, a little bit more detail. And from that model, we can then derive uh, characteristics and begin in the next section, 25, on some design issues on these transistors. So I'll see you in the next section.